the printing in white. And we ask everyone to participate with the, the yellow. Lent begins as Jesus is tested in the wilderness. We too are faced with temptations. And every test that you experience is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise. And he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it. And so provide you with a way out. Let us worship the God in whom we might have trust. I must needs go home by the way there's no other way but this I shall never get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss, the way of the cross is old, it is sweet to know as I own the way I must needs go on in the blood sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime, where the soul is alone with God. The way of the cross leads on. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way the cross leads on. And I bid farewell to the way of the Lord, to walk in it never For my Lord says, come, and I see my own, when he waits on the open door. The way of the Lord is made Away, it is sweet as I onward go. The way the ghost You may be seated. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I remember as a boy learning how to tie my shoes. And what a terrible thing it would have been if someone just told me how to do it and said, do it. But they showed me. They showed me how to twist those laces together and put those bows in and pull them tight. 
and even do a double knot because they showed me how they made it easy. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus, to show us how. Show us how to take your love and pass it on. Show us how to open our hearts to you in prayer. Show us that we can be forgiven. Show us that we have hope forevermore. And we are so grateful. Dear Lord, on this night, we had a nice dinner downstairs. It was so good to get back together again. And it was wonderful to be able to support the work of our mission team. As this year, they're going to be helping folks rehabilit rehabilitate their homes around here. It's a wonderful thing. And as we plan for this Sunday for our Lenten program, how good it is that we will be able to be helping college students develop their faith and even find it through InterVarsity. Bless the work we do here, Lord, and thank you for the love that isn't between just friends, but how we reach out into the community and care. During this Lenten season, help us to continue to follow Jesus so we can learn the way. Amen. And now Mr. Fred Marsh is going to help us with the prayer list. Prayer list. The prayer list for today, Ross Alio Sr., Brantley Black, Zach Bortner, Janet Conley, Michaela and Bonnie Daly, Karen Gibbs, Julian Grody, Tony Heiss, Paige Creel and family, Mary Lou and Donald Meckley, Lori Miller, Shirley Miller, Dorothy Nagash, Rick Riddle, Gary Rohrball, Shirley Russell, Lisa Seymour, Tim Shank, and Violet Smith. And the family and friends of Craig Zumbrum. And now may we all pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Your offerings can be mailed to Cindy Forbes at 5123 Sinsheim School Road in Spring Grove. The Sunday School offerings can be mailed to Neil Rohrball at 800 Mangus Mills Road in Spring Grove. And in the rear of the sanctuary are plates for both Sunday School and church. Bless the gifts our hands have brought, and bless the work our hearts have planned. Ours is the faith, the will, the God. The rest of oh God is in your Let us pray. Dear Lord, I remember a time when Rita and I were on a hike and we were so lost, we had no idea where we were. And out of nowhere comes this person and says, you look lost. Yes, we are, we said. And he said, follow me. And just as we got to where we're close to where we were going, he just disappeared. It was like an angel appeared out of nowhere and showed us the direction. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son who shows us the way that no matter how lost we are and whatever situation of life, he guides us. Thank you that we may give you out of the gifts you've given us, the blessings that we have received, we can share.
to help the work of the church, to help those in need, to share our faith with others. Bless these gifts and make them work richly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is the that makes me white as snow. No other protection. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing is my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. For the fact of you. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can foresee the truth. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a death on the Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all I do. I think that the blood of Jesus, this is all my righteousness. I think that the blood of Jesus. Precious is the Lord that makes me And now, will the children please come forward for tonight's children's story? There they are. We've got at least 20 coming down. No, no, not 20. No. Let's see who's going to be here. I see Anthony. I see Maggie. Let me make sure I've got the right people. What's your name, miss? Maggie. Hey, Maggie. What's your name, sir? Finley. Nice to meet you, Tony. So do you ever have times? Now, this is true confession time. You guys are good people. I know that. I hear all these great stories about you. But do you ever have times when you want to do something and you know if you do it, P 
people aren't going to be happy with you. Uh, do you want to tell me one of those? No. No. How about if I start out, okay? Okay. There are times that I'm standing in front of the refrigerator and I shouldn't be eating anything anymore at all. And there might be something that's calling my name. Bros, there's cake in here. Or there's pie in here. But of course, you know that like things can call your name, like your water bottle or the floor, stuff like that. You're saying they don't talk to me, huh? Yeah, but like hear the voices in your head. That's right. Exactly. You know exactly what I'm experiencing. Yeah. Now, do you have any stories like that? You'd rather not. Yeah, people, people don't like to confess their stuff, do they? So why do you think? There's sometimes we want to do stuff we shouldn't, even though we know we shouldn't do it. Any ideas? For me, I'll tell you my thing is that that piece of pie looks pretty good. And I'm just thinking of the immediate reward if I gobble it down, it'll be so good. I won't feel great afterwards, but going down will go pretty well. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes, do you ever get an urge to do something and you just feel all full of mischief? Like never, never, never push your brother or your sister or anything. I, I know you guys don't feel that way, right? Never. Or, uh, or, or, or I know, I know. Did you ever, did you ever find all the adults in the family are up late watching a program or talking or something? And you're thinking, why can't I be up? You ever have that feeling? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so how do you, since you don't, you know, you know, you seem both very aware of the fact that you, everybody has these urges to do things we shouldn't do. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you work around that? Well, you keep doing the right thing over and over until it becomes a good habit, not a bad habit. That is a wonderful suggestion. Wow. I didn't think of that kind of get in the habit of doing something good. Yeah, that's pretty everyone knows how you get bad habits you just keep doing the same bad thing over and over and that's actually, right so the people who notice it kind of think it's you're making the choice to do that yeah after a while they think well you should know by now especially because sometimes if you do something you shouldn't do then what happens is you either get into trouble or it causes trouble for you or somebody else or you hurt somebody's feelings right so you figure why don't they make the connection right but you're right observing and making the connection that if I do this, it's going to cause me more trouble later, right? Yeah, okay. Um, any other way? You can, uh, does, does it ever help? Like, like, let's say you feel like, okay, let's take a situation where a bunch of kids are at school and they're picking on somebody or they're being obnoxious in class. Obnoxious, yes. And there's, but there's a couple of students that are just doing the right thing. They're just being very nice people. They might even say, leave him alone, leave her alone. Look, the teacher's trying to teach us, knock it off, right? And so they're a really good example. And so sometimes we can follow them, right? Like my, that is just like my class. They do not listen, and I'm like the only one listening. Well, that's so good. Hi, Elijah. Come on in. Oh, that's same exact thing with my class. Everybody in my class is talking when I'm just sitting at my desk quietly and focusing on the actual lesson. That's really nice. That, the teacher must so appreciate you doing that, right? Oh, and you too. This year, I got my first male teacher, Mr. Callrider. I wonder why everybody always has to go like, blah, 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 this and that. I want to talk about this. No, we're trying to learn. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And if you don't learn, your parents aren't going to be too happy about that. And like, imagine that the next day, they pretend that this day you're like studying for a test and you didn't study. So then when you get your test back, you see you got zero out of 10 because you didn't study. Because yeah. yeah, you were doing all that silly stuff like blah, 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 talking and all that. Blah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's really good to... I mean, it sounds like you know your purpose for being there. You know, your purpose is to learn. And if you learn stuff, you'll be smart. And if you're smart, you'll get ahead. You know, yeah, super knowledge. Yes, right. So that'll be very good. Computer brain. Super computer brain. Yes. 
Yes. So, so it sounds like you know a lot of ways of keeping out of what's called temptation. Temptation is the word meaning. Do you know what it means? Um, tempting. Yep. When you want to do something you shouldn't do, but there's a real desire inside to do it. Yep. Yep. Well, this has been very helpful. I, I know I've learned something and I think you've helped us older people because you have some really good ideas for doing the things you should. And, uh, you know, just like you follow good people, we can follow Jesus, right? Who gives us lots of good examples. Yes. Well, thank you so much. It's so nice of you to be here tonight and to take part. I appreciate it. Yeah, you can go back down to your seats. Our scriptures today, the first is from Luke. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet don't do what I tell you? Anyone who comes to me and listens to my words and obeys them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man who is building his house, dug deep and laid the foundation on rock. The river flooded over and hit that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But anyone who hears my words and does not obey them is like a man who built his house without laying a foundation. Where the flood hit that house, it fell at once. And what a terrible crash that was. And from James chapter 1, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So it is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent that time of year when we try to more fully follow Jesus, when we try to be living more in his image, and we take a little time to maybe read the Bible a little bit more, maybe pray a little bit more. Of course, Ash Wednesday starts with Jesus going out in the wilderness and spending 40 days. He's out there for a reason. He wants to think about who he should be as a Messiah. Well, we say we know what he's going to be as, as a Messiah, but, you know, in those days, there were people who had definite ideas about what one should be as a Messiah. And interestingly enough, many of them didn't think it should be what Jesus ends up doing. So he's, he's got a lot of temptations, a lot of desires that might be lurking within to go in a different direction than he did. Now, for people in our day, the word temptation sounds kind of old-fashioned, you know, like those Victorian morals that people say, I'll tell you what to do with temptation. Bring it on. I want to do exactly what I want to do. You know, you've seen those people, how they act. But temptation is really quite modern in the sense that oftentimes we want to do the things we feel like doing that may not be so good for us. And we could end up betraying who we are as a person, going against our own values and our own best future, especially with God. So Jesus was doing something important. He took 40 days in the wilderness. He went without food. He is not going to allow himself to give in to his temptation, although like any human being, he's going to have it. I think if we take a look at his temptations, we might be able to think of 
how do we deal with our own? For example, the first one, the devil shows up. Now, the devil often plays different roles in the Bible. Usually it's a source of evil, but sometimes it's kind of like God's prosecuting attorney, the one that's trying to entrap us, doing something wrong, luring us away. But as you hear James say that God doesn't really tempt anybody. It's our own desires working within us. And one day in Mark chapter eight, uh, Jesus is telling his disciples he's going to die. And Peter says, no, no, Lord, it can't be this way at all. No. And Jesus turns on Peter and says, get away from me, Satan. Now, he's not saying that Peter's evil. He's saying that Peter's trying to entice him to do something against what Jesus knows he needs to do. So Jesus is pretty good about dealing with temptation. So look, let's look at the first temptation. The devil shows up and he says, turn these stones into bread. Sounds pretty good to me. I, I like uh, I like rye with a little fennel seed and it. it would be my choice, you know. Uh, and Jesus has been in the wilderness 40 days and I've heard of people lasting longer than 40 days without eating if they drink, but it's really, really hard on your body. And why would he do that? Well, that's a good question because we see this acted out in Jesus being told to turn the, the rocks into bread. And Jesus replies, you must not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's an interesting way of putting things. What does he mean by that? Well, have you ever had a really good cheeseburger, you know, you, or ice cream sundae, whatever your favorite food is, and you bite into it. And if you're really hungry, it tastes like the best food you've ever had. And then after about three or four bites, well, it's not so exciting. And once you've finished one burger, you may not have room for another, but you want to keep eating because you're looking to fill something in your in yourself and it's not food. And you think the next burger is going to do it or the next ice cream sundae, but of course it doesn't. It just doesn't fill that hole. In August, the end of August, we had two women who came to us and talked to us about the New Life Center for Mothers and Children. And they had quite a story to tell because although they were leaders of this organization, they had needed its service when they were young. Both had been sexually abused as girls. And the trouble with such abuse is often, it's so overwhelming and so traumatic that you don't remember exactly what happens, but the feelings and the emotions kind of bounce around in your, in your body, in your brain, and, but you can't figure them out. And so often people turn to drugs and both of them did. And they really got in a bad way spending all their money on drugs because they were getting this amazing high. And then when the drugs ran out, they had this amazingly horrible crash. Then they, they were driven to get more, which spent all their money. And then they started stealing to support their habit. They got into trouble. And finally, a doctor said to one of the women, look, if you don't stop it, you're going to die. I mean, if you don't overdose first and die that way, you're going to die because you're just ruining your body. So stop it. Well, she decided she'd check into the New Life Center for Mothers and Children. And they didn't yell at her the words of Jesus because she certainly needed more than bread and a lot more than drugs. Instead, they helped her with her life. They gave her Jesus as a guide who would help her through the most terrible times. They acted like Jesus in the way they fed her and supported her through times when she felt like the most miserable human being in the world. And eventually, both of these women got their life together. Not only that they could function, but they could both be responsible leaders and they're leaders of the center now. I mean, that's just a miraculous happening. And it all goes to prove what Jesus said. People can't live on bread alone, but
but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Because the people at the New Life Center were the word of Jesus. They acted it. They took part in it. They showed her what the Lord was like. So we too, as we face the temptations of our life, which are often about things and money and bread and security from having material possessions, we need a lot more than that. The second temptation is rather interesting. The devil leads Jesus up to the top of the pinnacle of the temple, which is 500 feet above the pavement of the Kidron Valley below. And the devil says to Jesus, jump. God's angels will hold you by the hand. They won't allow your foot to be dashed on the stone below. Wow. That would be quite a trick, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine how impressed people would be if he did such an amazing miracle as that. People would say, wow, I, he's, he's got he's to be God's son. He's got to be God's something to do that. But Jesus says something very strange. He says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. What's that all about? Well, Jesus is trying to tell people you can't do a neat trick to make people have faith. I mean, you think that people are going to have faith if you do some amazing miracle like that, but it doesn't always work that way. Do you remember there's a story in the Gospel of John where Jesus has healed a man who was born blind? It's on the Sabbath day. And even though he's done this astounding miracle, the Pharisees don't believe it, that he did it. He healed on the Sabbath day. He must be a sinner. How can he have done that? And so they launched this investigation. They asked the man's parents, was he born blind? Yes. How did he get healed? Well, you ask him. And then they asked the man a second time, how did it happen? He says, I already told you and, and you don't believe it. That man did it. And they said, well, that man's a sinner. And the man says, really? I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but no one has ever healed someone born blind since the beginning of the world. And here he heals me. And you think he's a sinner, right? They were so convinced that Jesus couldn't have done it, even though it happened right before their eyes, because they didn't trust him. They didn't believe in him. And belief isn't something you get a faith in God isn't simply you get by observing some miraculous happening. Instead, it's giving God the credit, giving God the trust that, that God can do something. For example, suppose you love someone. How do you love them? Do you love them because they do amazing and kind things? Well, it probably doesn't hurt, right? But when, when things are getting difficult or challenging, you can't go on that alone because you can always say, prove to me you love me, prove to me you care about me. And there's no way you have to give this person credit. You have to give them trust. Even when we forgive people, right? We have to trust them again. We have to give them the credit that they're capable of being a good and kind person because it's all about that love. We don't find faith by tempting God, by trying to get God to prove that God is divine. We get that faith and trust by believing and giving God the, the hope and trust that he's going to do what we want to do, to do for our good. Third miracle, Satan brings Jesus up to the highest mountains of the world so we can see all the kingdoms of the world. Now, I know there's not a mountain high enough to do that, okay? I, I saw this movie about Jesus once where Jesus is launched into outer space with Satan, and there they are, you know, about as far away as the moon, looking at this blue globe in the distance. Well, you still can't see all the kingdoms of the world, but it was a very impressive scene. Anyway, he says, all those kingdoms and their glory and power, I can give to you those kingdoms because they are mine, except here's the, you got to bow down and worship me. Now that might sound like a pretty good deal. You know, have you, have you ever felt power? Have you ever had a sense that you'd like to have it? Not, I know for you, it's not just to conquer and take over things, but 
to straighten people out, right? Well, if I was king, I'll tell you what I would do. I would straighten those people out over there who was always acting badly. I would tell those crazy dictators to knock it off. I mean, we'd fix them, right? But when Satan says, you got to worship me, it's not like, well, I'm going to go to Methodist instead of Episcopal or something like that. It's, it's not only worshiping Satan, it's, it's working according to the ways he works, all right? And up into Jesus' time and before his day and up to his time and up to ours, the only way people get to have that kind of power is they get an army together and they go and kill a bunch of people. I mean, isn't that what's going on in the world today? We have all these dictators trying to take over things and they always result in deaths. Hitler and Stalin and uh, Mao Zedong, all those people ended up killing millions and millions of people to get control. And Jesus wasn't going to do that. Now you may think, yeah, but what power did he have? I mean, he was never as powerful as those guys, right? Well, think about it. When you read the stories in the Bible, was Jesus powerful or not? Healing a man born blind, healing people who were lame, healing people who couldn't speak, healing people who seemed to be demon possessed, raising people from the dead, helping people to find a whole new purpose in their life when they were just completely going down the wrong direction. Amazing power. And more than that, although people, unless they studied history pretty well, don't know the names of all these dictators from long ago, but they know the name of Jesus. And Jesus has touched the lives of millions of people here and continue to do so, so that even young people know about his power and his love. That's amazing power. And yet, without any apparent power at all, the power of God, the power of love that can be ours if we only believe in him. So, as you can see, Jesus had an amazing way of dealing with uh, temptation. Much like our young people today, weren't, weren't they really smart on the ways they figured out to deal with things that they wanted to do but shouldn't do? Very impressive. And so as we follow Jesus in his ways of trusting in God and, and having faith in God, and believing in God's power of love and kindness and healing that we can't even see but works so powerfully, that kind of power and that kind of love and that kind of belief helps us to uh, fight the demons of our soul. We continue with the second part of our prayer list. For Sunday, uh, February 19th, Ray. I want to back up one. There we go. Gail Ambrosius, Reverend Julia Beal, Patricia Bland, Cindy Breeden, Danny, Barbara Dice, Carolyn Herndon, Kathy Neller, Patricia Gantz, Rita Passmore, Tim Shank, Jerry Shu, Michael Toman, Melissa Topper, Dorothy Trump, Tony and Tammy Vito and family, Darlene Worley. And from September 12th or February 12th, Karen Anstein, Fred Baber, Beth Brenneman, Pat Butler, Regine Crone, Jim Ursham, Steve Forbes, William Garman, Chip Hoover, Mike Jordan, Jennifer Coons, Kaylee Noble, Gail Taylor. Barb Trone, Beverly Trump, Bill W. and family, Ron Yingling, 
and Shirley Zumbrum. And from Sunday, February 5th, Thelma Balker, Kennedy Bear Jr., Reverend Phyllis Baum, Joe Black, Georgia Boris, Rachel Cooley, Chris Elliott, Gwen Eiler, Joan and John Fabiola, Jan Fr Fry, Steph Fry, Whitney Graybill, John Harris, Gloria Henry, Megan and Randy Herring and Baby Hunter, Paul Hughes Jr., Barb Coltrider, D. Jones, Gardy Lawrence, Jane Miller, Jane Nace, Greg and Sandra Pewterball, Jeanette and Dean Rohrball, Betty Rollman, Charles Van Scoy Sr., Ann Stone, Larry Thomas, Elliot Trump, his parents, Ben and Kristen, and his grandparents, and Sonia Walker. And for those that we keep in our continued prayers, Bob Anstein, Kevin Crum, William Dell, Dennis Fawzi, Todd Gladfelder, Lester Hackler, Cindy Helmers, Joan Hensel, Dr. Mark Hirsch, Dolores Jones, Warren Lockman, Ray Leapart, Dustin Miller, Bob Ottstock, Pat Palmer, Kathy Rohrball, Mike Schmidt, Sharon Schuler, Beverly Spite Muhammad, David Sprankle, Virginia Souter, Shari and Kenyon Taylor, Richard Brett Wilkinson, Kim Wilson, and Julia Woodby. Glory to thy gracious word, in me humility, this will I do, my dying Lord, I will remember thee. I must be broken for my sake. My bread from heaven shall be. I taste a bed come. I take and thus remember thee. When to the cross I turn mine eyes and rest on Calvary, O Lamb of God, myself sacrifice, I must remember thee. Remember thee and all thy pains and all thy pains. You are the bread of will I remember thee. And when these failing lips grow down, and my dead memory flee, when thou shalt in 
like you done before. Jesus, remember me. For those of you at home, we're going to have communion now and bread, crackers, juice, whatever you have will work. So join us for communion. And for those of you who are here, um, our consistory member, Dan Shu, has some of these little communion caps kits. And as we've said before, you take the side that looks empty, it really isn't, it has a little communion wafer inside, tear that open to get the bread. Then once you're done, turn it over, take off the cap, and there's the juice underneath. So anybody need any communion kits? There we go. Very good. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And Jesus said, we must not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God and Jesus, as we hear, in the Gospel of John is the bread of life, the bread that brings you to eternity. As we gather at this table from the east and the west and north and the south, let us take this bread in this cup that reminds us of the death of Christ. Let us take this bread and cup that reminds us that Jesus was condemned as a sinner, and yet God raises him to life and vindicates him. Is God will vindicate and forgive us. The bread that we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing that we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. This bread is the communion in the body of Christ. Take and eat of it. This cup is the communion and the blood of Christ. Drink of it all. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you have invited us to the table of your son. We feel as if honored guests because who are we to be invited to your son's table? And yet you give us so much, a model to share, someone to follow, not just in the easy times, but even through death itself, you are there. Bless us as we go forth to live your love in the world, to share your faith, and to take your hope for all of eternity. Amen. As we, as we sing our final hymn, all are invited to come forward to, to receive ashes on their foreheads or hands. I will say to each participant, we are dust and ashes, but for the resurrection power of God. And the ashes will be supplied, will be applied with a single use Q-tip to keep everything neat and tidy. 
So come forward during the hymn. I take the cross of Jesus Christ in ashes on my face. This ancient symbol made in dust reminds me of his grace. I beg for Mercy from my Lord to cleanse me deep within. I know myself, my faulty life, my tendency towards sin. O cross of ashes, speak again, in ways I understand. Speak for three repentance, let me know forgiveness from your hand. See Our hearts made whole, our thoughts made pure, our eyes This cross of ashes on my brow reminds me life is free. From dust I came, to dust I go, through soul pain and free. 
these forty things are set aside for the solution of all. Take the cross, deny themselves, and give to Christ their own. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Let us go forth confident in the love and forgiveness of God. Amen. One can reach one. As we follow after Christ, we all can lead one. We can lead one to the Savior. And together we can tell the world that Jesus is the way. If we each one.
you may be seated for a few announcements. So, Sue Barnhart is still collecting your Lenten prayers. They don't have to be something that would be in a poetry journal. They can simply be your expression of love or caring for God. You can be some saying something about, Lord, help me with how I'm feeling or dealing with children, whatever it is you're dealing with. Or you can, there's a scripture for each one. You can take a look at the scripture and maybe come up with something for that. Sue will be glad to collect your prayers or you can put them online. There's a link on the email newsletter. So those Lenten prayers are so important and we find them so meaningful. Uh, the Lenten program is this Sunday after church at 3 p.m. We're going to have Beth Wharton come to talk to us about uh, InterVarsity, which is an organization that seeks to bring faith to college students, which is often a time colleges aren't the most religious places. I, I don't know if you knew that or not, but, uh, you know, they tend to be quite different than that. So <laughs> it's wonderful for students to have a place where there are people with good values. They can study scripture. They can believe in God and feel like they're in good company. So uh, join us for that. Uh, we're going to have a time to hear Beth, to ask, ask her some questions. We're going to be writing some letters to college students. And Lorelai has a whole bunch of ideas of what you can put in a letter so you don't have to think of something out of the, the blue. And then we're going to be putting together these gift bags for the students. It's going to be about 50 bags. So we, we need some help in doing that. Uh, the flowers for this past Sunday uh, were given to the glory of God in honor of Mike and Gail Sterner for their anniversary, which is Sunday, Jonas Sterner, who had his birthday on the 15th, and by Mindy, Maggie, and Elijah. So thank you. And the postlude is called In Sacred Memory by Donald Lee Moore. Jonas.